good morning, Grace. I welcome you guys here one more time. My name is Clay, I'm one of the pastors for a short period yet until our family goes and moves to Edmonton in not too many weeks from now. So you'll get me today and one more time before the end of the month, and then I will no longer be preaching here on a regular basis. So you'll, you'll still get a great team with you here with Mark and the interns holding up the pulpit, doing a great job. So we are excited to once again continue to work through the scriptures. When we gather here, one of the things you'll notice that we love to do is teach and preach through books of the Bible. And we do that because we believe the Bible is God's word given to us to better know and understand this amazing God who loves us. He's given us so much. And the Bible, when we look at it, it's not just meant to help us to live a good life, to do better, to try harder. It's not telling us what we must do, but most importantly, it's telling us what God has done for us in this amazing story of redemption. That Jesus, the God-man, God made flesh. He lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died so that we could be brought into the family of God. Jesus, the perfect ruler and savior, died for sinners. He rose again, defeating our enemies of Satan, sin, death, and hell, so that we could now be part of God's family, heirs to the kingdom. And this is what he's calling us into, so that we can now be freed from the shackles of our self-rule and self-destruction. Now, over the last few weeks, we've been going through the Gospel of Luke, which is a biographical eyewitness account of a historian and doctor who just so happened to be named Luke. It's the biographical account of Jesus. And we've been going through chapters 12 and 13 over the past while, and I don't know if you felt like me, but it feels like we've been tossed back and forth, back and forth between warning and comfort, warning and comfort. And even over the last few weeks, it's maybe felt just more like hammering on the warnings. Unfortunately, we're not going to be led up on that today that much, but that's because the kingdom of God divides. You're either in or you're out. And so often, with most, like with most things in life, many of us, we feel like we just want to be able to come and go as we please. I'll make a decision later. I'm not going to commit. We're not the first generation that's had a hard time committing. We won't be the last. It's been like this since the beginning of creation, really. We keep thinking like, well, our generation's worse, or mostly it's like the generation after us. They're the ones who can't commit. But when we look at ourselves, we realize we have a hard time committing too. But Jesus tells us that his kingdom is not something you can just dabble in. It's not something you can leave, maybe think about coming back later when the mood strikes. He's very firm that to be part of the kingdom of God requires repentance. And repentance literally means to change your mind, to be transformed, to turn away from your old ways, your old thinking, your old way of life, your, own, your old attitudes, and to turn and face and then run towards Jesus. But like we saw last week, there's no shortage of hypocrites when it comes to people who either claim to follow Jesus or claim to follow God. They're those who appear like they may, might be part of things, but in reality, they're, they're leading people astray with their false piety and religious zeal. So today we're going to be continuing on where Mark left us last week in chapter 13. We're going to be going from verse 22 to the end of the chapter. So if you don't have a Bible, you can grab one by the giving box or you just bring one out in digital form on your phone. You might be able to download one if you don't even have one yet. But I'd love it if you bring your Bible out and turn with me to Luke. Again, we're going to be going from ch in chapter 13, verses 12 to the end of the chapter. But while you're turning there before we dig in, let's just pray to set our hearts right to hear from God's word. Father, I ask that you would be with us this morning. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear what you have for us. Father, speak to us through your word. And even as we read through it right now, would you awaken our hearts? Convict us where we need convicting. And give us encouragement where we need encouraging. We thank you, Father, for these words, for the scriptures. And thank you that you love us enough to tell us what we need to hear so that we could be united to you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, let's listen as we... Hear the scripture read. 
Reading from Luke chapter 13, verses 22 to 35. He went on his way through towns and villages, teaching and journeying towards Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? And he said to them, Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, and then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, We ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at the table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. At that very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. And he said to them, Go and tell that fox, Behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow, and the third day I finish my course. Nevertheless, I must go on my way today and tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it, how often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So let me ask you this. What is it that stirs you up, makes you tick? What is it that you strive for? As in, what is that one thing that you get so excited about that you move anything and everything in your life to make happen? Do you have career ambitions? Are there goals in life that you're working towards? Maybe thinking about a bigger paycheck, a nicer car? Maybe you've been dreaming of that big holiday you've been saving up for. Maybe there's a house that you have your eye on that is always just a little bit out of reach. Or maybe you're not so materially focused. Those things don't stir you up at all. You're just trying to figure out how you can have some peace and quiet. So maybe you're striving to get things done and move things around so that you can finally relieve yourself of many of those responsibilities that you have just so that you can have a few moments of peace and quiet and maybe some me time. Or maybe those things aren't what you're striving for, but you are striving to keep your family together. There's infighting and backbiting, and you are the only one who even seems to get the slightest bit of interest in maintaining some kind of unity. What about the rest of us? Maybe there's some of us here who just feel lost. Maybe we don't really have any goals. We're, we're just coasting through life, not really striving for anything. I mean, there may have been a, a point in our life where we were striving. We felt the thrill of pursuing better grades, winning a championship, maybe even finding a spouse. But now we feel like our striving days are over. We're tired. We're old. We're like 25. And we're just trying to live a life that doesn't rock the boat too much. Just doing what needs to get done just to get through the day. Now where we pick up in verse 22 here, Jesus is striving towards a very specific goal. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And he's doing so with intention. We're told in verses 22 and 23 that he went on his way through towns and villages teaching and journeying toward Jerusalem. And someone said to him, Lord, will those who are saved be few? Now I just want you to keep this in the back of your mind here. Jerusalem 
is the religious center of Israel. And Jesus is on a trajectory. He's on a mission. He's bringing the kingdom to bear in a place steeped in a very religious way of thinking. They already think that they have it figured out what needs to be done in order to get on God's good side. This is their perspective. This is the way they think. And in this, a question is posed. Now, we don't know what Jesus was teaching on that sparked this question. And, and who knows? Maybe the guy was just like me, and it doesn't matter what's going on around him. He's got a question. And it's like, I don't know what's happening, but I have a question. I'm going to ask it. And maybe he just has a habit of asking completely unrelated questions. But either way, he asks the question, and the question is, Lord, will those who are saved be few? So he's coming in with a few assumptions, isn't he? And for the most part, <clears throat> from what we see in Scripture, he starts off with a, a theologically correct assumption. <clears throat> Excuse me. We all need salvation. Do you see that? And I think deep down, we probably all know this, don't we? The world is broken. We can see it when we look out our front windows. We see it when we pick up our phones to check on the news. And if we're honest, we can see it in our own hearts too because we realize that we don't even live up to the loose standards we set on ourselves, let alone the standards that we end up putting on others. Things are broken. Things are not the way they should be. We need something done. We need someone to fix it. And really, since the beginning of time, people have been trying different ways to solve this dilemma, whether it's through religious, scientific, or, or simply means of personal development. We're all in some way or another looking to be saved from the brokenness we find ourselves in. But it's not even just in this life, is it? This life is not all there is, is it? I mean, except for a small minority in the world, most people believe that there is more to this life than what we can see. That there's something more, there's something bigger than what's beyond this world. And when you look at every religion in the world, with the exception of very few, most believe that there is a day of judgment coming when we need to give an account for the life that we have lived. Now, on the one hand, it doesn't really matter what people believe. It doesn't matter what other religions teach, does it? It doesn't matter if people say, well, I don't believe that. There's, it, it matters what's true. It matters what really is, right? But as we've seen over the last few months, when we look to the scriptures, Jesus, remember the man who claimed to be God, says that there is a judgment day coming. That means we all do have to face our Creator and give an account for our life. So when we talk about salvation, we're not just talking about now, the here and now, what we expect that, and what we understand we need fixing now. It's also talking about that day. We need saving from that too, right? Because if we look at the lives we lived, I think... If we're honest, if we actually think about it for more than a split second, not many of us are going to feel super comfortable standing before a holy, perfect, righteous, and just God. And I don't think we're going to say to him, you're pretty impressed with me, aren't you? Look at all that I've done. Even if, and this is the wrong way of thinking about it, but even if, there were to be some kind of scale that if our good outweighed our bad, I think if we're super honest with ourselves, we would go, I'd be a little scared of that. But the truth is, it's not about weighing the scales. It's not about doing better than the next guy. It's not about a little bit more good than bad. It's about how do we stand before a perfect God? And so we need salvation because 
our works, what we have done, are not enough to stand before that God and be welcomed into his presence, are they? So then the question is, if we need salvation, if anyone can be saved, who can be saved? And for those in Jesus' day, they would often be trusting that if, if you were Jewish and if you followed the old covenant law, at least as best as you could, then because of that, you'd be saved. God would spare you because of what family you were born into or if you converted and followed the law. So then it was either about your heritage, your religious works, or maybe a combination of the two. And so the question curiously gets posed, will those who are saved be few? How many people, Jesus? Is it a lot? Is it little? Some people say it's this amount and that amount. Well, what is it, Jesus? Now, you see how this question is posed as a hypothetical or just, you know, it's a theological question. Now, you need to know it's, it's not that it's wrong to ask theological questions. It's good for us to study theology, to figure things out, to get clarity on things. We should want to know theology to understand how things work. It's good to know proper theology. I'm never saying that we don't need theology. We, we need theology. But what's more pressing is, is actually how Jesus responds, because Jesus doesn't just want us to think theoretically. He's not so concerned with us just dotting our theological I's and crossing our T's. He doesn't just want us to think about how things work for everyone else and forget about looking at our own hearts and our own standings before God. I think sometimes we think, I'm going to think about those problems out there so I don't have to face the problems in here. It's like in our day when people ask some crazy hypothetical question like, what if there's someone out there in the middle of nowhere, like Wilcox, Saskatchewan, and they've never heard the gospel. They've never even met a Christian. They've never even had the chance to think about God. What are we to do with them? But Jesus doesn't want us to just deal with hypotheticals like, can someone from Wilcox be saved? There are real questions that we need to think about that actually implicate us, that we're not thinking about in those moments. So even in this instance, it's, it's not, the issue is not whether someone from Wilcox can be saved or not, but truly what Jesus is getting us to think through is what is your standing with God? And why? In the same way, Jesus gets straight to the point. And to everyone within earshot, he says this in verse 24. Strive to enter through the narrow door. For many, I tell you, will seek to enter and will not be able. He says, on the day when that judgment comes, many will seek to enter into his kingdom. They may even try to enter through the narrow gate, the narrow door. And Jesus says they will not be able to come in. You see, Jesus is saying that there is a time and an opportunity to enter into his kingdom. And there's a time when that will be cut off. We need to know that the door is open right now, but it may not always be open and it will not always be open. So if you are right now contemplating whether you want to follow Jesus, whether you want to repent, to turn away from your sin, and to run to Jesus in fullness of hope, Jesus is telling you, choose now. Don't wait for later. Because Jesus is reminding us, there may not be a later for you. Because that door closes in one of two ways. Either the day your life ends or the day Jesus returns. Whichever one of those comes first. There's some of us that get so focused on the day Jesus returns and we forget that there's a day coming for all of us that is nearing. Even if Jesus waits another 2,000 years, we're not going to make it that long. And he also might come back tomorrow. Because once Jesus returns and we stand before Jesus on that final day of judgment, 
It's the position that we held in this life that we will take with us on that day of reckoning. See, once that day comes, there's no going back. We don't get to change our minds. So if you chose on this day to stay on the outside, continuing to follow your own passions, your own desires, your own kingship, and your own rule, then you are saying to Jesus, I don't need you. I can be my own savior. My works will stand up before God. I'm good enough. And if you choose that, then on that day you will seek to enter into the door of beauty and perfection, the world that we all want with perfect unity with God. And you won't be able to enter. So then what is our option now? What are we supposed to do? Well, I want us to look back at that first word in verse 23. Jesus says, strive. Now, the word in the original language also means to agonize. It's a term that would have been used for Olympic athletes in training. If you're training to be the best at something, especially when it comes to physical exercise, you need to train to the point where you're training so hard, where you, you reach this point of real discomfort, real pain, agony even. And rather than give up, you push through it. You reach the point of agony and then you keep going. This is how you increase your strength. This is how you increase your stamina. This is how you teach yourself to lift more, to run faster, to run further than you ever thought possible. This is what it means to strive. This is the word Jesus uses. So if you're not yet a Christian and you're contemplating becoming one, you need to know that choosing to follow Jesus does not guarantee an easy life. In fact, it's much more likely that life is going to get a lot harder. The road is easy that leads to destruction, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount. So you need to know that the door to life is one that is filled with hardship, difficulty, and strife. It's a life of striving, pursuing, and of agonizing for the sake of of the kingdom of God. So in answer to this man's hypothetical, speculative question, it's like Jesus just says to him, forget about whether or not someone else is saved. Forget about the numbers and the statistics. Let's talk about you for a second. So you, yes, you. He's saying, do you have, do I have your ear? Can you hear me? Strive. Strive to enter the narrow door. And what is the narrow door Jesus is talking about? What does that mean to strive to enter the door? We need to know that the, the door Jesus is talking about, this narrow door, that Jesus speaks of is actually himself. So many people ask, well, why does Christianity have to be so narrow? We get to ask, why is there a door? Why do we get to go in? Like, I'm, I'm trying to do this on my own. It doesn't work. And Jesus says, there is a door. I am the door. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. But by God's grace, there is a way. And it's Jesus. We can come to the Father, and it's through Jesus. So now, strive to enter into that door. To do so means we follow and pursue Jesus with everything we have, because he is everything we have. It's about striving for and pursuing our relationship with Jesus. The truth is, to maintain any kind of relationship, it takes some striving, though, doesn't it? At least in the long run, it takes effort. It takes work. We're all in a relationship right now. Whether it's relationship with parents, relationship with spouse. Unless you are solely by yourself, you live with no one, you have no friends, you have relationships. 
And there are times that relationships are just more difficult than others. And you need to strive to keep them healthy. So let's just use the example of marriage, because that's a relationship that many people can relate to, obviously not all, but either you are married or you know of people who are married, and you can tell that sometimes it's, it's harder than others. So for those of us who are married, do you ever feel like it's a little harder to love your spouse? There are probably even days where you might feel annoyed with each other. And, and maybe you have the perfect marriage, but you can imagine someone who might feel annoyed by their spouse. You know, the things that they used to do that you thought were so cute are really now starting to get on your nerves. Or maybe it's, it's that things started off innocent and, and, and joyful, but lately, more often than not, your discussions start turning into arguments. Your playful ribbing is sometimes turned into sarcastic cutting. Maybe things aren't that bad for you, but things are not as good as they could be because the spark and the butterflies you first felt, they, they feel like they're just not showing up quite as often. You just feel yourself drifting apart. And it might not even have anything to do with what your spouse is or isn't doing. You're just feeling off. Maybe you're distracted with life. Kids' activities have come up. Or maybe you have new hobbies or, or there's just been so much going on at work. But whatever the stage and season that you find yourself in. There comes a point in every relationship where you need to look at your own heart and realize, in order to make this thing work, I'm going to need to strive and push past this to keep this relationship alive and bring it to a place of health and flourishing, not just survival. So if you're married, maybe you need to build some more intentionally intentionality even with how you look at your spouse, do you ever just stop and look and admire the person that God has allowed you to marry? And remind yourself of all the things you appreciate about them? Maybe you need to intentionally make time to spend with each other. Take some time to, to learn what makes them tick. If you've been married 10 plus years, they're probably not the same person you married anymore. They probably have new interests, new desires. Like, have you ever asked them, do you still like this thing anymore? So are you setting aside time to, to spend with each other, to be with each other, emotionally and physically? Is this a part of your routine to focus? Do you walk together, talk together, maybe even write to each other? These are forms of striving, Right? These are forms of working through this agony, this dullness, to push past, to see something beautiful. It's going to take some work, some effort. Again, it's going to take some striving to attain to something that ends up being beautiful and lasting with deep, rich roots that can actually withstand the storms and the difficulties and the seasons of life that you're going to face. And I use marriage as that example but in reality, how much more important is our relationship with Jesus? All those same things can be true. Obviously, Jesus isn't doing anything wrong. We often are. But when we realize that, are we striving to maintain this relationship with Jesus? See, there's probably going to be times where it feels like a burden to pick up our Bible. Or to gather with the church. Maybe even to pray. Maybe it's, it's weeks, months, years for some people since they even remember praying. Yeah, they might say a quick thank you at, at mealtime because they're obliged to. And there's just going to be times when that spark, those butterflies that you first felt when Jesus saved you and you, you got excited about being part of the church, that it no longer feels the same, even if it did feel that way at the beginning. But when we know that Jesus is truly our only hope, that he is a good, loving, and gentle Savior, it should actually cause us to set aside those feelings or lack thereof. The feelings of dullness, we can just set them aside. And we can move past the doubt and we can move past the shame that we might feel for not pursuing enough and we can strive. 
means we can pick up the Bible when we don't feel like it. We can join God's people and lift our voices and maybe even our hands as an act of striving to build and maintain this relationship. It means we might do simple prayers like just saying, Hey, Father, sorry I haven't talked to you in a while. Can I spend some time with you? Because he's willing. He's waiting. He loves us. So push through the apathy. Push through the pain. Push through whatever it is that is keeping you held back. And run the race with endurance, not because we're trying to have to work for our salvation. Because it's not about that. But do it because you want to maintain and even grow and expand your relationship with Jesus. Because if we don't, if we just give up, if we just move on, or, or even worse, if, we're just, if we decide we're just going to put on a face and go through the motions so that the people around us think that we're faithful, all just pursuing a religious appearance without actually pursuing Jesus, then on that day when we are standing outside the kingdom of God, expecting to be let in, we're going to be wishing we had actually entered into that narrow door. So Jesus drives this home then with a short parable. Let's go up to verse 27. When once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to stand outside and knock at the door, saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer you, I do not know where you come from. Then you will begin to say, we ate and drank in your presence, and you taught in our streets. But he will say, I tell you, I do not know where you come from. Depart from me, all you workers of evil. What we need to see here is that these are people who expect to be in the kingdom of God. He's not talking about the people who know they've rejected God, is he? These are the religious people, the upstanding people. The crazy thing is the, these are the people who assume they are saved. There's so many people who believe that because they just believe that they'll be welcomed into God's kingdom because they said a prayer or because they went to church or because they, in, in this time and place, they're even saying, well, we were, we were with Jesus. We saw him. We heard him preach. We listen to his teaching. Nowadays, they might even be decent, upstanding citizens with great church attendance, better than most of us. But there's no real spark. There's no desire. There's no striving. It's, it's kind of like this, I checked a box, been there, done that kind of attitude. We're just playing a game. But yet we still start to believe that we're saved because of our proximity to Jesus. It might not even be those who are part of a church, but how many people think they're saved because their grandma's religious? Or because their parents took them to church when they were younger? Or because their spouse is a Christian? But then there also are those who think they're saved because they're part of the right kind of church. You know, the church that teaches the right doctrine, uses the right words, has the right slogans, teaches from the right Bible translation. There will be those who show up before Jesus on the last day and they will say to Jesus, but, but, I, I was part of a gospel-centered church. They even, I mean, they adhere to all the solas. They taught the Bible. We even recited the catechism. Come on, you got to let me in. Isn't it crazy how so many of us can be so concerned with being part of of a church and being surrounded by really good teaching and yet we fail to actually live it out and adhere to it? We don't want to implement it. We just want to be taught it. What we need to know is that you can't be saved by your pastor's faith. You can't be saved by your parents' faith. You can't be saved by your spouse's faith. 
Jesus wants, to, wants us to think through. What's your relationship with him like? Where are you with Jesus? Remember, it's not about somebody else right now. It's what are you doing with Jesus? Now, the question isn't even, do you know about Jesus? Do you know of Jesus? But Jesus wants us to think through, does Jesus know us? Does Jesus know you? And if he does, are you striving to keep this relationship moving forward? Do you strive to follow after him? Or will he say to you, I don't know where you come from. And with that, he'll declare, depart from me. Look what follows, verses 28 to 30. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, but you yourselves cast out. And people will come from east and west and from north and south and recline at table in the kingdom of God. And behold, some are last who will be first, and some are first who will be last. So how, how sad would it be for us to see the heroes of the faith, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the prophets, and even all of those people who you thought, and you were sure that you were so much better than, standing way in front of you to enter into the kingdom of God, and you were at the back of the line. And the door's closed. And you're cast out. Jesus says the result of that will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Some of the first will be last, and the last first. The religious, the self-righteous, the ones who think it's by their actions, their good works, their good deeds to those who are constantly just trying to impress everyone else or even trying to impress God. They'll be cast out. Jesus reminds us here that this religious activity is not the same thing as pursuing a relationship with God himself. Now, as Jesus is saying this, the crowds are likely just taking it all in and wrestling with it. But there are those who likely did not like what Jesus was implying. So they speak up in verse 31. That very hour, some Pharisees came and said to him, Get away from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Now, maybe that sounds like, oh, the Pharisees, they're helping Jesus? They're trying to protect him? Maybe? I mean, it's probably very likely that Herod was out for him. I mean, who needs this guy like stirring up trouble and causing all sorts of problems? But I think more than likely, and most commentator, commentators seem to agree that the Pharisees were really just looking for an excuse to get Jesus to leave. He's disrupting our way of life. He's, he's causing people to ask questions, not just about themselves, but about us. I mean, they were the religious leaders that Jesus was implying that would most likely be gnashing their teeth. But Jesus uses this as an opportunity to drive a point home again. Let's continue in verse 32. And he said to them, go tell that fox, behold, I cast out demons and perform cures today and tomorrow. And the third day I finish my course. So Jesus says, I'm on a mission. I have my plans. There's nothing that's going to stop me. I mean, if Herod wanted to try to stop Jesus, he could try all he wanted. But Jesus is just going to keep doing what he's going to do. I mean, it's the same thing today. Jesus has a mission. He, he has purpose to save for himself a people. He says that he will build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He is moving forward. He is on a mission. He is calling us to follow after him into the kingdom of God and the gates of hell cannot withstand it. And look at the last part of that line. The third day I finished my course. Do you hear echoes 
of the resurrection there? There's a plan. There's a purpose. There is a resolution that Jesus is pursuing, that he is striving for. Verses 33 to the end. Nevertheless, I must go on my way in tomorrow and the day following, for it cannot be that a prophet should perish away from Jerusalem. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often I would have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, and you were not willing. Behold, your house is forsaken, and I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So Jesus once again mentions Jerusalem, doesn't he? Remember, it's the religious center of Israel, and yet he speaks of it as the place that kills the prophets, that stones those who are sent to it. Religion's not the answer, is it? And yet he still has a tender heart towards these people. Do you see that? As a hen gathers her brood under her wings. Jesus loves these people. Jesus loves broken people, even religious broken people. His desire is not that we stay in a religious mindset. His, di- his desire is not that we stay in a licentious, a self, self-desirous way of life. He loves these people, and yet he's disappointed, right? No matter how many times God shows his love and sends messengers to call them back to himself, they reject the messengers. They reject the message. They, they're just not willing, and they, they reject God. So he says, that at the end of the day, their house is forsaken. And then Jesus quotes from Psalm 118 when he says, And I tell you, you will not see me until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Now, Psalm 118, it's a great psalm. It has a lot of repetition. It actually starts and ends with the phrase, Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. This line is repeated throughout the psalm. And in this psalm that speaks so much of the steadfast and faithful love of God, it was a reminder to Israel and all of us who read it later that salvation depends entirely on God's faithful striving and pursuit of us. See, it's God who opens the gate. It's God who welcomes us in. It's God who willingly and lovingly sends his son to be the cornerstone of our salvation even though he knows he'll be rejected. Psalm 118, verses 21 to 23, it's kind of right in the middle. It says this, I thank you that you have answered me and have become my salvation. This is the psalmist speaking to God. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. See, when the religious and the so-called upright rejected Jesus, Jesus didn't give up. He didn't worry about whether it was going to be too hard. He pushed through. He determined to strive to obtain our salvation. This wasn't just a little bit of striving, a little bit of agony, a little bit of a pain. This isn't like when you you push to finish a a kilometer and, and you're 200 meters in and you're like, I can't do this anymore. I give up. This was agony. And Jesus agonized all the way through Jerusalem to the cross. He bore our sin and our shame and our punishment. You see, when Jesus tells us to strive to enter the door, he's saying that who has, as one who has already done the work and continues to do the work to bring us into the kingdom of God, to make this relationship happen to allow us to experience the fullness of God's forever love. See, Jesus hung naked on a tree in the place of sinners like me and you. This is how far Jesus would go to strive to obtain our salvation and this eternal relationship with us. 
And the beauty is that on the third day, he would conclude his work, just like he said he would. And he would do this by defeating death, rising again, and preparing a way for us to follow after him through death into the fullness of his eternal kingdom. And then he also sends us his Holy Spirit. He gives us the Spirit of God as a seal of the promise of our redemption. Do you feel like you're having a hard time striving and straining and pushing forward and pushing past the agony? Are you listening to the power of God that he has placed within you? You have access to God himself who wants to give you the strength to strive, the strength to pursue Jesus. But we have to remember, there's no amount of work, there's, there's no amount of good deeds, there's no measure of religious sacrifice, suffering, or service that could pay Jesus back for what he's done. That's not what we're trying to do. As, as we strive, we are not trying to get right with God to pay him back. No, with the power that the Holy Spirit gives us, as we lean on the grace of God, we strive simply as a response to keep our hearts engaged, to nurture the relationship, to continue to turn away from our sin and our self-destruction and our self-rule, and to turn back to Jesus again. The continual act of repentance is an act of striving. So now this is our focus. This, this is your focus. Don't get lost in the what ifs, the what abouts, the, the who else's. Strive to enter into that narrow gate, the narrow door. Don't let your relationship grow stale. Don't just allow yourself to play the religious game. Follow after Jesus as one who has been striving and agonizing for the sake of those who would follow him. Father, I ask right now that you would allow us as your church to strive after you. Help us to do this as a whole, as your people, but also individually as your people. Father, help me to pursue you, to pursue Jesus, to pursue the Holy Spirit. Help us all here individually to continue to pursue you but then also help us to help each other to pursue you. Help us to remind each other of the goodness and grace of who you are and what you're calling us to. And Father, fill us with your spirit. We know we can't do this without you. We know we can't pursue you with the strength that we have. We need your strength. And give us joy. Give us joy to pursue, to move through, and even in the agony of fighting the fight of the faith that you've given us. And help us to trust that it's not by our pursuit, it's not by our striving, but it's by your striving that you've done for us that we can be accepted and welcomed into your kingdom because you are good, you are gracious, you are loving. So we pray this all in the amazing name of Jesus. Amen.